Last year, my Patreon supporters got a Christmas story called My Name is Scrooge, and I thought for this year I would do a reading of it. So here you go. My Name is Scrooge, a Christmas story. Everyone knows the name. It's unmistakable. You start to spell it out for a reservation or a computer form, and you can see the look in their eye, that oh my gosh of recognition. The second thing they think to say is usually, I bet you get a lot of jokes about that. Any relation, the clerk says now. And instead of doing my normal song and dance ha ha, I tell the truth for once, grand uncle with some greats attached. Particularly ironic now, California hot, but still the season for candy cane lattes and little green and red wreaths printed on the coffee holders. You get any ghosts coming to see you on Christmas Eve? He starts to laugh, thinks himself cute with his half shaven skater's hair and the tattoo cruising along his forearm. But I don't smile as I stare him down. I wish it was just on Christmas, I say. He can't think of what to answer, just gops at me and I take my plastic bags and leave. Outside, the Salvation Army guy is ringing his bell every time he catches someone's eye, smiling and wishing them a Merry Christmas. He knows that it ups his chances if he's friendly, particularly if he's friendly enough that they feel guilty about not dropping a bill into the black iron kettle. He starts to smile at me and I say, is the Salvation Army still maintaining its discriminatory stance on homosexuals? Because that's usually what the ghosts dealing with charity related regrets focus on, whether or not your donation actually changed anything. I know that from experience. Sometimes the question is new to the Salvation Army bell ringers, but I can tell this guy has heard it before, maybe even from me on some past holiday season. His lips compress and his eyes narrow. Merry Christmas is all he says. And I just smirk back before I head to my car, the tiny red and green Volkswagen in the corner of the parking lot. All the way home along Highway 1, there's a ghost in the back seat trying to convince me that the road trip I didn't take my freshman year in college would have changed my life and that it's not too late to pack a suitcase and head down to Austin. It's supposed to be weird and lovely down there. The ghost is fixated on the bats underneath the Congress Avenue bridge, keeps describing them to me, along with the man I was supposed to meet and kiss there for the first time. Kiss under the bats, really? I say when it concludes its spiel for the third time. It's a sightseeing boat with a kerjillion bats flitting overhead, shitting on people, I say. Look, that seems like a really bad way to start a relationship, and I never kiss people the first time I meet them. You never know where they've been. How many ghosts of regret would be following me around right now if I didn't have basic policies like that? That ghost flickers out, speechless and defeated. It's one of the romantic ghosts which all sort of blend together after a while and have shown me all the places I went wrong in my life, usually with a plethora of suggestions on how to fix them, most of which are entirely impractical. At the front door, a ghost reminds me that I should have taken out the garbage last night, and this time I do make the effort to change things, which is a mistake in and of itself because the ghost gets so excited by my cooperation that it starts letting the rest of them know. And so I spend the rest of the evening telling a bunch of ghosts no for the second time. I wake up around midnight and there's a ghost peering in the window and beckoning to me. I get up and go to the window, slide it up and say, go away. It says, you didn't go for a midnight walk when you were 13 and your life changed for the worse. That's a bunch of hooey, I snap. What I regret is wasting a lot of time discussing the nature of probability and alternate time streams with creatures that I'm not even sure are ghosts. It looks at me with damp, limpid eyes like a dog watching you eat a hamburger. What else would we be but ghosts? You show up because I've got some sort of supernatural sensitivity, I say, or that's the claim at least, but maybe you're some sort of ancestral hallucination or an alien creature conducting experiments in psychology. Look, those ghosts that appeared to my great, great, whatever grand uncle weren't even really ghosts. They were figurative concepts. Christmas past, 
Christmas present and Christmas future, how would those have died? What does it mean that they're ghosts? The ghost is getting interested in the argument despite itself. They know they're not supposed to interact with mortals on any subject other than the regret they're expressing. At least that's the excuse a lot of them have given me in the past. But sometimes you can get one really wound up and going. There's something about that state that cancels them out. So if you can get one excited enough, it will start up ranting and go and go till it pops like a soap bubble. The other ghosts get scared off when that happens. So every once in a while, it'll buy me a day of peace. But this one starts to say something then catches itself, closes its mouth and eyes me sternly. How could a midnight walk change my life anyhow? I asked it. It shrugs, spreading its ectoplasmic palms wide in a helpless gesture, then beckons, indicating that I'm welcome to follow it and find out more. Tempting. But I turn my back on it and crawl into bed anew, turning my back on the window and refusing to look at or speak to the ghost. I don't know how long it stands there, but I think it's a good long time. That's the only ghost that visits me that evening. I would have appreciated the decent night's rest more if I hadn't been in the habit of waking up as it was since most nights were full of ghosts. This time for once I dream, and I remember the dream after I wake up, which never happens. Usually all I come out with are incoherent scraps, people trying to tell me things that I can't hear or understand, people far away pretending they don't see me. This time, I remember every moment from when I first realized I was dreaming to when I wake up. I was going down a grassy path with little trees on either side, scrubby little Christmas trees with fairy lights on them, but so dim you could scarcely see them. It was the early evening and there wasn't any snow on the ground, but you could feel the trees wishing there was, if that makes sense. And that was the point where I wondered whether or not it was making sense and realized I was dreaming. So I kept on down that path, running, and sometimes trying to fly, because you're supposed to be able to do that in dreams, and still I couldn't. The path ended, and I almost tripped over my own feet, looking at the little house in the clearing that was in front of me. A haunted house. You could tell that just from looking at it, not to mention all the ghosts that were sticking up their heads out of the windows. I could tell I was supposed to go forward and into the house, but I said out loud to the air, I don't want to go in there. I get enough ghosts in my life without dreaming about them. Can you tell you're dreaming, really? Said a voice from somewhere overhead. I spun around and looked in the tree branches, but I couldn't see anyone. I'm here, the voice said behind me. And I spun around so fast I left my breath behind and had to stand for a moment panting in order to let it catch up. It was a man in old timey clothes and I could tell it was supposed to be my ancestor because I'd seen enough versions of him in the movies by now that I could spot a Scrooge 15 seconds into a production. I thought this would be the best way to communicate with you, my child, he said, brow furrowing. But if you know that you're dreaming, that upsets all the protocols. I'm not sure how to proceed. You can proceed by telling me how to get rid of these ghosts, I say. Oh, no, he says. You don't want to get rid of that. Your ability to see the spirit realm is the most promising thing you've got going, my child. A smart mouth will only get you so far. What am I supposed to be doing with all these ghosts, I say? Yours came with simple directives, and there were only three of them, all connected. I've got ghosts of every kind of regret known to humanity, and some emotions that haven't been felt in a thousand years. You need to pay better attention to them, he said. Ghosts can tell you all sorts of things. If you get anything out of my story, it'd be that, about the importance of listening to ghosts. The importance of celebrating Christmas, you mean, I say, but my ancestor shakes his head. No, he says very decisively. It's about the importance of listening to ghosts. I told it to Dickens myself. Any other interpretation is someone getting the story wrong. Ah, said a ghost at my elbow, regret for the wrong interpretation. It shimmered in and out of sight as though contemplating the idea serene as a tea service. Parasite, my ancestor said to it. The ghost looked offended at the idea. I see what you mean, my ancestor says. Those are the kind of ghosts that spring up all the time. You're not supposed to be able to see those, only the important ones. What makes a ghost important, I ask. My ancestor shakes his head with an impatient frown. That's a silly question he has. 
You're just saying that because you don't have the answer, I tell him. He looks away at Huff's indignantly again, but more quietly this time. Regret for the inability to supply an answer the ghost offers. We both round on it. Shut up. I think about my dream, and it's the fact that it's the day before Christmas. When I go into the kitchen, I find my ancestor Scrooge sitting in a dining nook, examining the advent calendar my mother sent. Why haven't you opened all of these, he asks. Look, this one has a chocolate inside. I get tired of all the Christmas cheer, I say. He looks around. Where's the tree, he says in a tone of deep horror. I shrug. It's all hype, I say. If there's one thing that Christmas specials have taught me, it's that the spirit of the season doesn't depend on having the right trappings. Well, true, Scrooge says. He looks around some more. Some trappings are nice, though. It would at least move us in the right direction. You want trappings, I say? Turn on the TV. It's 24-hour Christmas by now. There's one channel devoted to Christmas story and another to programs about Santa. He shakes his head. Spare me the incantations of yon witch box, he says. You were speaking modern English just a few moments ago, I point out. He glances around. They approach. He pauses, then sighs out the end of the sentence, F. The sky overhead is in full night mode, spread with stars. As I look up, I see something enormous approaching, blotting out the clouds. It comes impossibly fast, so quickly that it turns my bones to water and makes me feel weak. That was when I wake up for real, and it's Christmas. There's something about waking up on Christmas morning, even when you're as full of cynicism cynicism as any cartoon villain. You open your eyes and there's sunlight on the snow, the room full of light, and for a moment, just a moment there, I'm not thinking of anything except, if you had treasured moments like this more, you would have a store of them, a ghost intones by my ear. Holy fuck! I sit up, startled. It's like a cat. You can live with one for years, and that whiskery nose in your face in the morning will still shoot you out of sleep as fast as a rocket going off, and just as disconcertingly. There's a ghost talking about the Russian class I failed in college near my bookcase, and another ghost calculating what my cholesterol level was but could have been by the refrigerator. Another points out if I hadn't started drinking coffee before the age of 21, my grandfather would have given me a thousand dollars, which I could have parlayed into any number of possibilities. Or blown, I say, sipping my coffee on weed or a trip to Europe or in a few hours at any racetrack. That's another thing about these ghosts. They hate it when you bring up games of chance. They never talk about the what might have beens of lottery tickets or bingo cards or anything like that. Maybe that's an actual rule because they won't explain that one at all. When I look up, the ghost is staring out the window. You don't usually catch them off guard like that, thinking their own thoughts. So I take the chance to look it over. He resembles the cute barista from the day before, but as though he'd been washed out, rendered in beiges and grays, the tattoos erased, shorter, broader across the shoulders. I leave him there and go out to my BW. I keep thinking about my dream, about the original Scrooge. When you look at it, A Christmas Carol isn't about regret haunting you, but about an actual threat. You will die if you don't celebrate Christmas. That's the future the ghost of Christmas yet to come threatens Scrooge with, showing him the servants quarreling over the loot from his corpse and then his own grave. Scrooge averts it by learning to keep Christmas well, and he did so for all the rest of his days, or so Dickens said. And I had every reason to believe that Scrooge had done so, at least long enough to tell the tale to Dickens. Even though it's Christmas Day, the coffee shop is open, half full of people pretending to write novels on their laptops and checking their phones. I pause by the doorway, a ghost of teas never ordered murmuring in my ear, something low and British accented. The barista is there, and I see him through a blast of steam, so his outline is vague, then sharpens as I appear. The little drummer boy plays on the Muzak all snare drum rhythm with a chaser of flute. Ms. Scrooge, he says, and serves me up a smile that makes my heart expand. What ghosts do you see, I ask? What regrets do you have? He doesn't say, I beg your pardon, or excuse me, or even what? Doesn't do any of these little stalls or pretenses of not hearing. Instead, he looks at me, considering the question. 
that I didn't get your number the last time you were here, he says. Ghosts press in on every side. Some speaking of lost loves or past moments and all the things I've done wrong in the past. And most of them say I shouldn't do what I do next. But I do it just the same as if none of them were there, whispering warnings. You can't let regret rule your life, I tell him. I print my name and number on a coffee cup holder and slide it across the counter, keeping my fingertips on it. Ghosts are ghosts. They'll always be there. But if all you do is listen to them, you'll never hear anything new. He nods, eyes bemused, lips quirking in a half smile. He reaches out, twitches the cardboard slip out from under my fingers, doesn't look at it as he tucks it away in his back pocket. The music changes to, what child is this? And both of us say at the same time, this is one of my favorites. And for once, None of the ghosts is saying it along with me. Or if they have, they've gone so dim and faint that I can't see them anymore. Thready as the memory of my great, great, great grandfather telling me that maybe my story isn't anything like his at all. Happy holidays, no matter how you celebrate it. Thanks a lot.